Hello. Hi. Good evening. Exciting, exciting, exciting. Oh, look, all these nice folks here already. Timothy and Jared and Jim and Melissa and Jerry and Alexis and Lalani and Brian. What's up indeed? What's up to all of you? Um, very nice to be here. It is Sunday evening. I am more or less compass mentis and more or less conscious. So, um, we're going to be reading. Uh, I will tell you in a moment what I'm going to be reading. Just updating uh, everybody. We're all fine here. Um, my mother, who tested positive for COVID-19, is doing m better, uh, you know, out of quarantine now and now testing negative for whatever the hell it is that you test for. I'm never quite sure in these situations, but um, sorry, I'm always fascinated by how my beard sticks out in weird directions uh, when I'm looking at myself in the monitor. Anyway, so family good, hope same is true for you and your loved ones out there in the middle of the COVID pandemic um, and the monumentally bad, bad situation we're still in, although um, we uh, have no cause for personal complaint here, other than the fact that we're worried about our loved ones and other people's loved ones as well. Anyway, so I am going to be, I found a, a story Many of you will remember, I think a few weeks back, I read you a uh, Pogo Cashman story called Go Ask Elric, which was uh, about uh, Pogo, who's kind of a version of my teenage self, um, meeting Elric of Mel Nibine, Michael Moorcock's famous uh, sword and sorcery albino wizard sad teenager, although he's not literally a teenager, but he's clearly a stand-in for sad teenagers everywhere, which was why all the sad teenagers I knew who read fantasy fiction loved Elric. Anyway, Elric is not the issue here, so let's not get too hung up on Elric, fabulous as he always was. Um, but I, I did find my other uh, published uh, Pogo Cashman story, and I need to tell you just a tiny bit about it before I start reading. I'm not going to finish it tonight. It's quite long. It's actually kind of like novella or novelette length. So um, I'm only going to get halfway through. But that's okay because there's lots of rip-roaring action. Actually, it's mostly silly. Um, this one was written, the, the, the one I read to you before was written for a uh, Michael Moorcock Elric anthology. Um, I don't have the information. Actually, let me see if I can find it just at the moment. Uh, no, I'll, somebody can look it up for me if they want to be kind. Um, it was published originally in a tribute anthology for Paul Anderson, the very, very excellent fantasy and science fiction writer, and also the father of, uh, of Astrid Bear and father-in-law of Greg Bear and wife of Karen Anderson, a uh, wife of husband of Karen Anderson, all very important people in science fiction. And uh, Greg and Astrid are also friends of ours. So um, I was very happy to be asked to contribute. My favorite Paul Anderson book was always something, uh, it was a, one book called um, Three Hearts and Three Lions. Some of you out there may have read it. Uh, Three Hearts and Three Lions tells the story of a uh, it was probably written in the early 60s or late 50s, but it tells the story of a uh, scientist who is, in various ways, travels through into the what is often called the matter of France, just as like as does the King Arthur stories are called the matter of Britain. The matter of France are the stories of Charlemagne and his court, Roland and Astolfo and various other uh, knights who who. Uh, fight for Charlemagne. And it was like the matter of Britain was a whole series of stories. So in Paul Anderson's story, um, a modern day scientist is cast back in time or back into a fantasy world actually, which is the world of um, 
the uh, among other things, one version of it is the famous uh, Orlando Furioso. Orlando is Roland, who was kind of Charlemagne's Lancelot. Um, so, but there's been many, many stuff, and a lot of I think the Fairy Queen is based on it, and the the Charlemagne legends, the Carolinian legends. But you don't need to know most of any of this stuff because, as I said, the story is borderline silly in places and fairly self-explanatory. I do have to tell you a couple of things, which is like the Elric story, which had two focal points, both Pogo, the young male California kid from my era, uh, and Elric. Well, in this one, it's um, there's, there's two viewpoints also. One is Pogo's, of course, and the other has nothing to do with Paul Anderson's story at all, but is uh, basically a... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? A, a, a lower, lower, lower management blip named Quid Probe who works in the um, some kind of universal department of fictional worlds, as you will see in the story. However, the one other thing I have to warn you about is that um, at least one of the characters has a Scottish accent. So I'm going to be Mike Myersing it up here. Uh, so bear with me. Those of you, any of you out there who are actually from Scotland or have any respect for it at all, please forgive me. Um, I'll probably throw in some other accents. I haven't actually read this story again. I haven't had time since I found it. So I'll probably, who knows, the accents may go wandering all over the place as I try them out with things and decide I don't want to do them or whatever, but I'll try to keep things as clear as possible. So anyway, so this is the return of Pogo Cashman in a story set in the matter of France, at least in part, and um, it's based on, or it's a, a riff on Paul Anderson's very fine novel, Three Hearts and Three Lions, in which this scientist turns out to be Holger the Dane, who's one of, at least in his past reincarnation, turns out to be Holger the Dane, um, and discovers that that science can, in fact, be applied to fantasy fictional settings, which is one of the big fun parts of the story. You find out why why uh, a, a giant's gold is cursed and how to kill dragons and all kinds of things. That's Paul Anderson's original book, much worth reading. My story, however, is much sillier, and it is called Three Lilies and Three Leopards and a Participation Ribbon in Science. All right, so here we go. Don't freak out, Fernando, Pogo told his assistant manager. I'm just go into the food court. You'll be fine. Little Fernando tried to smile, but it was the sickly grimace of an infantryman ordered to charge a machine gun nest. He pointed with a shaking finger at the crowd of bargain hunters that had turned Saturday afternoon at Kirby Shoes into a battle zone. But uh, it's the summer madness event. Perry Como Cashman, who had been named after the singer by a soon-to-be absent father and had been called Pogo by his friends since junior high school, sighed. I know, dude, but I haven't been out of the store since I opened at seven this morning and I haven't eaten anything and I'm starving. Little Ed's back from his break and, and Big Ed's here and uh, what's his name? You know, stockroom dude can help out if you really need another body. I'll be back in like 20 minutes max, so just hold your water. Pogo patted Fernando on the shoulder. I'll bring you back something if you want. Fernando's eyes were showing white around the edges. A gun or a knife, please. That lady threw a hiking boot at me. Emergency, shouted little Ed from the other side of the store. There's a woman climbing the display wall trying to get the last set of kids Adidas. Oh man, she just clubbed somebody with a Brannock device. Pogo was whistling as he made his way across Victory Plaza Mall. It had been a serious pleasure to leave Fernando and the others to deal with this latest crisis. For at least the next few minutes, the only thing he had to decide was whether he wanted cashew chicken, egg rolls, or both. As he circled an ornamental fountain full of splashing toddlers, he thought he heard someone calling his name. He did his best to ignore it, but a few moments later he heard it again felt it might be more accurate, since it was so faint, so distant. He turned with a grunt of irritation, expecting to see Fernando or one of his other salesmen chasing after him, but saw only the usual afternoon shoppers, bored young mothers, and seniors avoiding the San Fernando Valley heat in the air-conditioned mall. 
Pogo, Pogo Cashman. He turned in a full circle, but nobody was even looking at him, let alone calling him. Hunger hallucinations, he thought. Better get some pot stickers too. Pogo! This time, the voice sounded so close he whirled, expecting to find some practical joker standing right behind him. But he was alone in the center of the shopping center concourse. An instant later, he fell through the floor, tumbling through the very fabric of reality and into a darkness that throbbed with honks and squeals like a prog rock band tuning up. He fell for a long time, long enough to get bored. I really wanted some egg rolls, was his last thought before he abruptly fell back into the world. The problem was, it was not the world that Pogo Cashman had fallen out of in the first place. Did you do yourself a hurt, my lord? Small rough hands pulled at him, trying to help him sit up. Are you wounded? Pogo was wondering about that himself because everything sure smelled, sounded, and looked strange. Some shit had definitely gone wrong, either with the Victory Plaza Mall or Pogo Cashman himself. All the walls seemed to have fallen down and he was surrounded by trees instead of retail stores. Also, why was Fernando talking funny? And why was there a big black horse standing just a few feet away? My lord, what befell you? Fernando, you were supposed to... But then he realized it wasn't his diminutive assistant manager standing over him, but someone quite different. In fact, the stranger made little Fernando look like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. He was a dwarf with a nose like a brown avocado, a bushy, dirty beard, and large, bare feet. Who, who are you? Pogo asked him. Now, how did I get to Disneyland? I ken that land not, the small fellow said, but you know me sure, Lord. Ludo, your ain sworn vassal, your ain sworn vassal. <laughs> Pogo was really beginning to worry now. He had never had the greatest imagination, except during his youthful days of pharmaceutical exploration. And if he was imagining all this, that had to mean a pretty severe head injury. And I never got my lunch either, he thought sadly. Now I'll probably spend months eating hospital food. Okay, Lou, he said, trying to be a good sport. Then if this isn't Disneyland, where are we? The dwarf frowned, obviously concerned. The forest of the Arden, Duke Astolfo. Sure, you must recollect. Duke Astolfo? The name was sort of familiar. A relief pitcher for the angels, maybe? Professional surfer? Uh, hey, should somebody call an ambulance? Because I, I think I might have a brain injury or something. Or, or could you kind of steer me back to the mall at least? Uh, I manage Kirby Shoes. You know it? Across from Orange Julius next to J.C. Penney's? Ludo shook his head. This is nea good, and the dark will come soon. We mon make camp. Yeah. So is there a snack bar or a store or something around here? A, a mini mart? Because I never got any lunch today. But the dwarf only shook his head again and helped Cashman to his feet. He was stronger than his size would have suggested. Can you ride, my lord? On a horse? Pogo examined the huge black beast. Horses didn't look anywhere near so big on television. I don't know. Is it hard? Supervisor Finet had called a sudden and mandatory meeting for all management personnel. Even sub-sub-manager Quid Probe, the new kid in the office, knew that had to be a bad sign. All the dozens of managers and sub-managers of the crossover division of the Department of Fictional Universes were crowded into the conference space, although most of them looked as though they would rather be pretty much anywhere else. Fanut, the supervisor, was pacing back, at the forth, back and forth at the front of the room, or what would have been the front if the Department of Fictional Universes had been in any way compelled by Euclidean geometry. This is bad! Finette squealed. 
The supervisor was a small green fellow with a small green mustache and a tendency to become shrill. Very, very bad! At the moment, he was in danger of shattering every coffee cup in the room. How could this happen? Does it matter? asked Bardler, who managed the matter of France, his tone heavy with doom. It's happened. It's too late now to do anything but watch the destruction. Quid Probe, a sub-sub-manager in the Paul Anderson subdivision, with untaxing maintenance duties in the seldom-accessed Ariosto section of Anderson's Matter of France, raised a rubbery three-fingered hand. I, I, I still don't understand what happened. One of your boss Diggory's idiot clerks sent the wrong personnel request, Bardler snarled. And so some idiot named Cashman, a shoe store manager, no less, was dispatched to Anderson's medieval France for a tricky assignment, instead of the guy who was supposed to go, Porter Gervais Castlemaine, an English chemical engineer and former SAS officer. Bardler scratched both his noses. Who would have been perfect, by the way? Castlemaine can kill a man with just his fingertips. Yes, we sent the wrong initial request, bubbled Quid Probe's boss, Diggory. But then one of your idiot, idiot, idiot clerks didn't see our correction form. Diggory was so upset his face was pressed against the window of his tank and his nicotating membrane snapped up and down like windshield wipers in a deluge. We spotted the mistake in moments. We sent the proper MP362A immediately. But someone in your office must have been taking a nitrogen break. Bardler didn't seem to have an argument at the tip of his feeding tube, so he just scowled. Stop! We'll figure out what went wrong later. Supervisor Finut was getting dangerously squeaky again. Right now, we have to think about something to do about this catastrophe. Uh, can't we just reverse it? Asked Quid Pro. He had been less than a century on the job, very young by departmental standards, but he was ambitious, as the young often are. As far as he could tell, the other managers uniformly loathed him for it. It doesn't work that way, screeched Finut, his mustache writhing like a caterpillar on a griddle. Departmental regs say that once the personnel unit has been transferred into the fictional world, any change of plan has to go to the top for approval. The very very top. Just the look on Finut's face was enough to make even the most hardened of department employees moisten with fear where his, her, or its limbs attached. So either we call the big boys right now and tell them we have royally screwed the tetramorph or we have to leave him there. And if we leave him there, everything else will go wrong, said Barter, Bardler darkly. Roland will stay insane. Nobody will save Charlemagne from Agramant and Aelfric. Christendom will totter and fall. B but it's only a crossover story about the matter of France, one of Anderson's old books. In fact, what we're dealing with here isn't even an actual story by Paul Anderson, said Quid Probe. I, I was looking over the order this morning. It's only some kind of pastiche for an anthology based on his work. And not very closely based either, I couldn't help noticing. I suspect the guy writing it is a bit of a hack. So who cares? But what Quid, when Quid Probe saw the look on the faces of his superiors, his cheerful smile faltered, and he blanched right down to his basal chromatophores. Um, what don't I understand? Supervisor Finut was clearly doing his best not to lose his temper, but some of the more veteran managers looked like they were already wondering if they would get time off to attend Quid Probe's funeral. Listen, youngster, what you don't understand is that when something goes wrong with an important cre creator like Anderson's version of a world, the problem will ripple out from there. Ripple? Quid Probe looked around. It means, you bottom hole breather, growled Bartler, that when this Cashman guy fails, it'll infect the entire matter of France. The whole thing, not just Anderson's version, but Ariosto, 
the Song of Roland, which is incidentally the oldest surviving piece of French literature, and who knows what else. Bardler was getting angrier as he spoke, and Quid Probe was now doing his best to slide under the table. But Thier had made the sub-sub-manager rubbery, and he was going horizontal as much as vertical. A few weeks from now, Bardler shouted, Charles the Great will probably be known as Charles the Loser. Even Quid Probe's boss, Diggory, looked anxious. That bad? Really? You knock the pins out from under Charlemagne, and after a little while, there goes Arthur and the round table, too, Bartler declared with a certain grim satisfaction. And then, goodbye, English literature. Farewell, Eastern European humanism. So long. It was fun. Right if you find work. Enough, squeaked Finut. Bartler dropped back into his chair and subsided into scowling silence. All around the long table, managers and sub-managers shifted uneasily, thinking, thanking whatever they prayed to that they were not in Quid Probe's now rather viscous seat. In fact, Quid Probe wasn't in it either. He had finally managed to slither onto the floor. It's your orb and your game now, Finet told them with dark finality. As far as I am concerned, this meeting never happened. And when I'm ready to send my report at the end of the day, I don't want to see any loose ends that I'll have to report to you-know-who. Finette rose to his full, if unprepossessing, height and marched out of the conference space, followed a moment later by his mustache. So, said Digri at last. His bubbling voice seemed so loud in the silence after their boss's retreat that even Quid Probe, reorganizing his splayed pseudopods on the floor beneath his chair, could hear every word quickly, clearly. What do we do next? I hear there might be a few openings in the Department of Pointless Philosophical Rambling, ventured one of the sub-managers. By the time young Quid Probe had finally managed to clamber back up onto his slippery seat, the conference space had emptied and a large shouting mob was forming around the copying device as his fellow managers and sub-managers hurried to update and dispatch their resumes. Truly, you remember not? asked Ludo, his face scrunched in dismay like an old paper bag. Not your dalliance with the fair Alcina? How the sorceress tired of you and turned you into a wee myrtle tree, and all the hounds would make water upon you? Huh? Cashman was doing his best to understand the dwarf, but the little fellow was clearly suffering from some kind of head injury himself. Some of his words sounded like English, but the rest were gobbledygook that sounded like the excitable guy on Star Trek. I, I don't know, man. Can we eat now? Nay, we canna eat yet. We hadn't called Pogo my lord in a while. I've had a chance to find victuals, have I? Vegetables? Can't we get some real food, like burgers or pizza? Victuals! I said victuals, are you deaf? I'm not deaf. I'm not even nearsighted, dude. How come you can't talk like a normal person? Like me? Like ye? Like ye? For a moment, Ludo seemed angry enough to walk off and leave Pogo in the woods alone. But then he flopped himself down beside the sandy trail and folded his short legs up under him. Go take up yon shield he said. Shield, at least, was a word Pogo recognized. He lifted the big hunk of wood and metal off the saddle horn of the black horse. He didn't have to reach as high as he expected to, and his hands seemed bigger and stronger than he remembered. He was beginning to wonder if the world around him wasn't the only thing that had changed. Yeah? Look on yon painted crest. Tell us what you see. Pogo decided he must mean the painted front of the shield, so crest must mean the advertisement on the front, like the stripy Adidas flower. Yeah, he said, the crest, I see. Very interesting. The design was weird and old-fashioned, a huge trademark of crudely painted lion-type creatures alternating with what Pogo was pretty sure was the New Orleans Saints football team logo. He stared as hard as he could, but it yielded up no secrets. And, do you can it not? 
Ludo asked. The three lilies and three leopards of England, the token of your father, the king. My father is a king? As far as Pogo knew, his father was a guy who painted faces on rocks he found at the beach and sold them to tourists. Aye, and you have a grave duty to awe of Christendy. Can you truly remember not? communication thing was beginning to be a problem. I got to be honest, Louie, I didn't understand a thing you just said. The dwarf stared at him for a moment, then went off muttering and sat on a fallen tree, pulled out a huge pipe, lit it, and began to smoke like a man who was in a hurry to achieve lung cancer. Quid probe was the only person left in the conference room. He might even have been the only person left in the entire building. His co-workers had hurried off to renew old friendships in other departments that might have openings, or establish alibis for where they had been when the wrong personnel requisition got approved for the Anderson world. Anything but dealing with the actual problem. Well, quid pro thought, let them. I'm not like that. I'm a fellow who solves problems instead of running from them. Also, he didn't know anyone in any of the other departments very well. In fact, after a short hundred years or so in the job, half the people in his own section still didn't know Quid Probe's name. Fnut's universal viewer was still sitting on the conference space table, and Quid Probe was curious to see what was going on with the botched transfer. Perhaps this cash man creature would turn out to be just as good as the one everyone had expected to enter the science fiction, enter the fiction world instead. Perhaps everything would turn out all right after all, and all the veteran department managers had panicked needlessly. And if he brought them this good news, perhaps Quid Probe himself would get some of the credit. He even let himself fantasize for a moment that this could be the start of big things for him. A raise, maybe, maybe even a promotion. By the peerless punctuation of Poe, wouldn't that be grand? He could get himself a new exo container that wouldn't break down half the time, and maybe even some top-of-the-line rigid graspers. Ooh, wouldn't the folks back home stare and jealously emit Phosgene when Quid Pro came back to visit and told them he was a supervisor? And when he whipped out his fancy new graspers and, and grasped things, well, his old classmates would just froth themselves with jealousy. After all, he thought, dialing through the various Pole Anderson worlds, past the speeding Leonora Christina and Dominic Flandry, leaving behind the modernist creations and moving farther and farther into the more primitivist inventions, such as the High Crusade and the man who came early, how hard could it be to succeed in an environment as primitive as the matter of France, where... Most people couldn't even remove their heads without incur incurring permanent damage. The Pogo cash man organic might not be all that advanced himself, but at least his civilization had discovered things like nuclear power and canned foods. At last, the focal window located the three hearts and three lions world and dilated wide so that Quid Probe could get his first look at the Pogo cash man creature. The Pogo Cash Man's assisting character, a construct named Ludo, was trying to teach him how to fight with the ancient weapon known as a sword, which apparently was the main form of social intercourse in primitive France. But the Pogo Cash Man was sitting on the ground, whimpering in pain, his hands bloody. You're supposed to hold the other end, the dwarf said wearily. Quid Probe had a sudden, powerful urge to look over his own rather slight resume to see what needed updating. He stabbed at the button to close the focal window, but the machinery was made for co more conventionally rigid digits than Quid Probe's, and he wound up pressing the button beside it as well. He had only a moment to stare at the label under the accidental button, which read, Intervention. Do not engage without departmental permission in boldly emphatic symbols in several appropriate languages. Then Quid Probe abruptly found himself drawn into an infinitely long thread and then pulled through an infinitely narrow and infinitely painful needle's eye before the darkness swallowed him. 
Pogo could only stare. The dwarf, who a moment before had been glaring at him in that way of his, which was already becoming sadly familiar, had abruptly straightened up and made a noise like a hamster clubbed with a tennis racket, then dropped to the earth in a heap. Now he was lying there looking quite dead. Pogo was just wondering if he needed to find Disneyland's security or something when the dwarf groaned and sat up. Where am I? The little bearded man asked, looking from side to side. Then he saw Pogo and groaned again, this time even louder. Intervention! Oh, Lolitas of Liber, I pushed the intervention button. Pogo wasn't sure what the little fellow was babbling about, but he was pleased by the sudden change in the dwarf's speech. You stop talking funny. The other stared for a moment, his mouth working deep in his beard. Then he sighed and said, Right, I've replaced the assisting character and the machines have keyed my dialect to the main character's own form of speech. Just as well, I never understood that detail of the original story anyway. Why would a French dwarf be speaking with a Scottish burr? Huh? The dwarf stood up and slapped the dust and sand from his trousers. Very well, let's figure out how we're going to get this fixed so we can both go back home. We're in some serious difficulty here and changing dialects is the least of our problems. He turned to Pogo. Let me ask you one important question first, preacher. Is there any chance at all that my managers are wrong and you're really Castlemaine from the SAS? Special Air Services? Does that mean anything to you? Pogo thought hard. When you're on a plane and they bring the cart with the drinks? Excrement of Ellison! The dwarf sat down again, this time with a thump. They were right! Ah, well, we might as well make the best of this. My name is Quid Probe. Huh? I thought it was Lego or something. Never mind what it used to be, it's Quid Probe now. And you are the Pogo Cash Man, correct? Uh, yeah. Um, I managed Kirby's Shoes in the Victory Mall in the Valley. The dwarf shook his head. But this still doesn't make much sense, even if someone sent the wrong form. Usually the obvious mistakes get thrown back by the machines before they're executed. He turned to Pogo. Is there a reason the multiverse should choose you instead of the right fellow? Or was it just a really, really unfortunate clerical error? Have you ever been involved in dimensional slippage before? Pogo shrugged. Well, I, I guess I experimented a bit during high school. I mean, <laughs> like, didn't everybody? The dwarf sighed and pinched the bridge of his nose between thumb and forefinger. I've only had a head for a few minutes, and already I have such a headache. So that means you don't know anything about the madness of Roland or Charlemagne or any of this, do you? And I'm guessing that you don't know who Roland is, the character you're supposed to help, or Charlemagne, the character he's supposed to help. And so, of course, you also don't know how important all this is, do you? Pogo looked at him seriously, really, really trying to focus on the important things. Uh, no. Hey, before you fell down and started talking normal, didn't you say something about dinner? <sighs> Do you understand now? Quid Probe had put it in the simplest possible terms. Words and concepts so basic that even an infant of this backward existential plane could understand it. He fixed the organic creature with a hard glare. It's important that you do. The pogo cash man smiled hesitantly. Can you run that all by me again, man? I think I missed a little of it. Sorry, I I'm really hungry, man. Quid probe sighed. Very well, but pay attention this time, will you? Stop swinging that bladed weapon around before you cut your own head off. The pogo cash man blushed and slid the sword back into its scabbard. Sorry, who, who did you say you work for? The Department of Fixable Universes? Fictional Universes, the Department of Fictional Universes, Crossover Division, Pole Anderson Subdivision. And you're right in the middle of three of them, at least. 
Quid probe scratched his face, distracted by the borrowed body he was wearing. It was strange to have his brain perched in a round box of bone at the top of a fleshy stalk like this, and the hairy tendrils on the dwarf creature's face itched him horribly. This is a mess, that's what it is. The chosen main character was supposed to be this castle named British fellow who was crossing over from your organic world into a fictional universe created by the famous science fiction writer Paul Anderson, which itself was a version of the fictional universe called the Matter of France. With me so far? The Pogo Cashman looked interested. Well, what is the matter with France? I mean, some of that stuff they eat like frogs legs of France, the matter of France. It's like the French version of the King Arthur stories, except instead of King Arthur and his knights, it's Charlemagne and his knights, Sir Roland, Sir Roger, Duke Astolfo, Holger the Dane, all those legendary characters. The creature nodded cheerfully. Okay, I'm totally with you now, man. Sir Loin and Chateaubriand and the rest. Quid probe ground his teeth together for a moment. Another odd sensation, like having an oral cavity full of stones. Patience, he told himself, this poor creature has to live with teeth all the time. But this isn't even Anderson's version, you see. It's some other lesser writer's version of Anderson's version. And somehow when this idiot anthology writer started his story, instead of this castle name fellow crossing over from the real world, into the Anderson universe, you showed up instead. So instead of a problem-solving engineer and man of action, we have... He broke off. No need to rub it in. Do you know anything about engineering? Physics? Anything at all? The Pogo Cash Man considered. I got a participation ribbon in science once. See, I was making this volcano for the science fair, but I was late for school, so I figured I could mix the baking soda and vinegar first, then it would save time when I got there. He shrugged. It sort of exploded my backpack, but they gave me the ribbon anyway before they sent me home. Quid probe winced. Yes. Well, science not a strong point then, but we have bigger problems at the moment. The creature nodded more emphatically. Yeah, man, like getting something to eat, right? No! Quid Probe was beginning to understand that this was going to be even more difficult than the series of impossibilities he had already conceded. No, like figuring out how an unprepared cipher like you is going to help the great Roland get back his sanity and save this world from being conquered by the forces of chaos. And besides your complete lack of scientific knowledge, we have no other tools but Astolfo's enchanted horn and a book of useful spells, both of which are in your saddlebag, by the way, so don't lose them. But it had suddenly occurred to him that perhaps he wasn't listening to his main character as carefully as he should. This Pogo Cash Man was a creature not of the symbolic plane, like Quid Probe himself, but of the physical. Perhaps all his talk of hunger was meaningful. Perhaps he really did need some kind of organic sustenance. Perhaps he would be more responsive once he'd taken in nutrients. Quid Probe strode to the edge of the clearing and looked around until he detected the life signature of a small creature, a rodent with a bushy tail. He caught it with a quick grab of his still unfamiliar hands, carefully crushed its skull so it wouldn't suffer, and then dropped it in the Pogo Cash Man's lap. Um... The recipient looked with dismay at the gooey mass. The tail was still twitching fitfully. Isn't there any way to uh, uh, cook this? I don't doubt it, said Quid Probe. Start a fire. The oxidation process should char the meat efficaciously. He was tired. The transition into this physical body had taken a lot out of him, and carrying around the weight of a skeleton was extremely wearying. I wish you success in your consumption. Huh? By Howard's holy haunches, you do say that a lot, don't you? Quid Probe's patience was growing thin. He desperately wanted to rest the clumsy organic body and put his mind to work. Go ahead and consume that. You'll need your strength. 
Our task here won't be easy and we'll probably die horribly. He rolled himself up in his cloak and stretched out on the soft forest earth, which is only slightly better than having Supervisor Fanat angry at me. But of course, I'll likely get both. Pogo had dropped out after the first day of Boy Scouts when he realized there were no snacks at meetings and they all seemed really fired up about taking a 50 mile hike. Since he hadn't stuck around to earn his camping merit badge, he wasn't really certain about the best way to cook a smashed squirrel. The fire had burned down nearly to ashes, just a few smoldering coals. Pogo tossed in a few small twigs, but they were green and wouldn't catch. He went to the saddlebag, being very careful not to startle the scary big black horse and look for anything useful. He found a cow horn with silver decorations on it and a seriously old-fashioned book. The dwarf had said it was something about spelling. Pogo squinted at the strange writing and couldn't make out any of it, but he didn't really care anyway. He already knew how to spell. Hell, he'd spelled Mississippi right once in fourth grade in front of the whole class, which was pretty good for anybody. He tore a page out of the book and held one corner to the coals. The piece of rough, thick paper caught with a strange green-blue flame, and for a moment he thought he could hear voices whispering in the wind. But then the page was gone, and the voices were, too. He wadded up several more pages and kept tossing them in until the fire was really burning then jammed the squirrel onto a stick and poised it above the flames. It actually smelled pretty good, except for the burning fur, and he began thinking it would be nice to have something to drink as well. After a short search, he found one of those Renaissance Fair squirt bags hanging on the saddle. When he squeezed it, something like honey-flavored vodka jetted into the back of his throat, that which didn't go down his chin or onto his chest, and it took him a while to stop coughing. The medieval booze wasn't southern comfort or anything, but it was still pretty good, and Pogo wished he had something less messy to drink it out of. As he sat smelling the squirrel, now bubbling nicely, he suddenly thought of the horn. Wasn't that what those old-timey guys drank from in all the movies? He squeezed some of the honey stuff into the horn. It promptly ran out the narrow end and into his lap. He took another messy swallow from the bag to help his imagination, and sure enough, he soon had an idea. The binding of the book was held together with some kind of glue. So he peeled some of it away, wadded it up, then poked it into the narrow end of the horn. It held pretty well, and now he could use the horn as a drinking cup. Swigging from his horn and moving the squirrel around the fire to keep it from burning, Pogo began to feel like a true knight of the oldie times. Enough honey stuff, and he didn't even mind burning his fingers on hot squirrel meat. Food in his belly, and a nice buzz starting, he sat for another hour or so drinking and feeding the rest of the book to the fire. The colors and whispers and shapes that rose up with the smoke were as entertaining as any double feature of the Claremont drive-in. Time to go, the dwarf said loudly. Pogo skinned his eyes open a crack. For some reason, the sun was up. Man, quick poop, not so loud. Quid probe, my name is Quid probe. The little guy didn't sound happy. Get up, we have to save Roland and yesterday was all but wasted. I'm into that. Pogo groaned and sat up. He was lying beside the ashes of the fire pit and realized he must have passed out there. The empty bag and the horn lay beside him, both covered with a surprising number of ants. He staggered to his feet, gingerly brushed off the busy little insects, then snuck the two objects back into the saddlebag. The dwarf reminded him a little of his old high school math teacher, and Pogo didn't want him any grumpier than he already was. You said this rolling guy went crazy? Pogo asked when they were riding again. The dwarf perched on the saddle in front of him. Pogo didn't really care about Roland, but he was trying to distract himself from the immense huffing monster of a horse and the way that its bumping progress made his stomach and head feel, which was not too great. Really crazy? 
uh, was it like a drugs thing? No, it was a love thing, the dwarf told him. For love of the fair Angelica, Roland has lost his wits. Now the greatest knight in Christendom has become a violent madman. He has killed hundreds of his own allies, destroyed whole towns. Worse than that, the pagan armies of King Agramant, aided by Duke Aelfric's evil fairies, have besieged good King Charlemagne in Paris. If Roland cannot be returned to sanity to fight for Charlemagne, more than Paris will be lost. Whoa, said Pogo. Like, what else? Everything, said the little man. If the armies of chaos triumph over Charlemagne here, then soon King Arthur and his round table will fall too. Folk tale and myth will totter. Soon the most important tales of Western civilization will collapse. Juliet will not love Romeo. Faust will not make his bargain. Robin Hood will be executed by the Sheriff of Nottingham. Even little Oliver Twist will die a pauper. Pogo did his best to sound intelligent. Yeah, wow. And that's, that's all bad stuff, right? Quid pro made a noise of frustration. And of course, Starsky and Hutch will be killed in a fiery automobile crash. Oh no, not the Torino. Pogo almost fell from his saddle. All because of me? Unless we do what needs to be done, Pogo Cashman. Unless you can fulfill Duke Astolfo's destiny by recovering the hero Roland's wits and restoring him to sanity. Pogo considered this awesome responsibility. So how are we supposed to cure this Roland guy of being crazy? He asked the dwarf. Therapy or, or something? Because I don't know much about that stuff. He pictured himself taking notes on a pad while a man in armor wept on a leather couch. Or should we just uh, take him to a real doctor? His wits are utterly lost. They must be recovered, as I told you. That means we have to bring them back to him. Bring them back? Pogo frowned. Where are they? On the moon. So, hey, Quillpod? he asked some time later. If we're in one of those fairy tale things, why don't we just hurry up and fly to the moon? My name is Quid Probe, and it doesn't work that way, the dwarf explained through clenched teeth. Quid Probe, please remember. And the reason we can't just fly to the moon is that these rules of these things say you have to earn your passage. You're a knight, after all. The great Duke Astolfo of England. You have to do some courageous knightly deeds. The dwarf thought for a moment. Or at least that's how it usually works, but I think we'd better just try to avoid getting messily killed and hope we get lucky somehow with the whole moon thing. Messily killed. That sounded even worse than we can still be friends, which up to now had been Pogo's least favorite phrase. So where are we going? Well, we're making a very wide detour around the house of Caligarant, the ferocious people-eating giant. Then we're heading north. Somewhere along the way, you're supposed to get a flying horse and give Rabican here, he gestured at the huge steed beneath them, to fair Bradamant. Then you help out Prester John, king of Ethiopia, and afterward you can ride the flying horse to the earthly paradise. The holy folk who live there will help you get to the moon. Whoa, sounds like a lot of commuting time, Poco pointed out. Why don't we just phone some of them and ask them to meet us somewhere? The dwarf shook his head and made a little gurgling noise. That 6,000 years until I retire is beginning to seem like a long time. They rode for most of the day until the sun was low in the sky and the forest had largely given way to a flat, desolate countryside haunted by croaking ravens and the cries of other stranger creatures. The ground on either side of them was wet and treacherous, the path so narrow that Rabican could scarcely put one hoof in front of the other. Pogo had long since digested the apples he had scavenged for lunch 
and was seriously wondering why no one in this place had ever thought of a restaurant, let alone a drive through when the dwarf suddenly reached out and grabbed Pogo's arm. Rain up, Pogo Cashman, he said. I think I may have made a mistake. We're supposed to be going around the swamp, but instead it looks like we're heading right into the middle of it. Pogo was trying to pay attention to the little man, but he was distracted. All day long, wasps and bees had been swarming around his saddlebags, and he couldn't figure out why. He kept fanning them away, and he kept, but they kept coming back. Right now, a particularly, particularly large bumblebee was climbing his arm like an angry ball of lint. And that's bad? Balls of blish! Yes, that's bad. That also means we're heading right toward Caligarant. The bumblebee finally sputtered into the air and then landed on the saddlebag again and crawled inside. Pogo exhaled. Phew! And, and, and who's he again? Only the nastiest giant in all these parts. An ogre who eats nights the way the, that other folk eat salted nuts. He owns the unbreakable net of Vulcan, and he hides it in the dirt near his house and chases travelers into it. Quid probe suddenly began to squirm sideways in the saddle, trying to look back at Pogo. And if we're in the swamp, then we're already too close to him. He stiffened and stared. What's that out there? Do you see that? Pogo turned to look over his shoulder. What, the, the, the big boulder? That's not a big boulder. This is a swamp. Have you seen any boulders this afternoon? It's a giant trying to hide in a very flat place. Pogo felt a cold chill go up his back. Yeah, it, it does sort of look like that, now that you mention it. And then the boulder stood up and began hurrying toward them, the ground shaking with each huge, huge step. Oh, shit, what do we do? Pogo squealed. What do we do? It's coming. Use the book of spells. The what? That book? I burned it! Even with the ogre bearing down on them, the dwarf turned to stare at him in astonishment. You burned the book of spells? I thought you said it was a spelling book. I needed to cook the squirrel. We're in a forest, literally surrounded by wood, and you burned the book of spells? You idiot! Quid probe sounded more like Pogo's old math teacher than ever. Quick! Blow the enchanted horn. Its noise terrifies everything that hears it. A look of panic crossed his wizened face as he saw Pogo's expression. May the large lizards of Laguin defend us. Don't tell me you burned that too. No, no, he pulled the horn from the saddlebag. Here, see. Quid probe stared, wrinkling his nostrils. It stinks of mead. And why is it covered with insects? Pogo tried to shake off the stinging bugs, but they clung fiercely. The giant thundered toward them. Me so hungry, the ogre boomed in a voice that made Pogo's bones vibrate. His mouth was huge and his teeth were yellow and jagged. Food, don't run. Blow the horn, screamed Quid Probe. What are you waiting for? Oh, why couldn't you have been a chemical engineer or something useful? I'm trying, Pogo shouted, and it was true. He had been blowing into the horn with absolutely no result. Pogo was beginning to feel that plugging the end with gooey book glue might have been a mistake. Look out! Quid Probe leaped off the saddle as the giant stretched his vast and dirty hand toward them. Pogo threw himself after the dwarf, still clinging to the magic horn. Little men, not fall down, boomed Caligarant in a disapproving tone. You run! Make more entertaining! Pogo had the horn against his lips once more and was blowing as hard as he could, puffing until his cheeks ached. The giant paused to observe him, a look of confusion and, and hurt on his wide, ugly face. Why you not run? Better you run. Fall in net. Bend me eat. Fun for everyone. Pogo took a moment's rest from his fruitless blowing. His head was swimming and he felt like he was going to pass out. No, thank you, he panted. We don't want to be eaten. Me think you unreasonable, said Caligarant, 
spreading his tree trunk arms. But me guess me eat you anyway. A close-up look at the giant's hideous maw was all Pogo needed to decide to start blowing again. Just as he was certain his brains were going to fly out of his ears before he could coax even a squeak out of the horn, the hardened plug of glue popped out of Pogo's horn and, covered in confused ants and angry hornets, shot up one of Caligarant's huge and hairy nostrils. <laughs> bellowed the giant, leaping up and down and slapping at his sinuses in dismay. Bees in nose! Bees! Pogo and Quidpro managed to scramble out of the way, but noble Rabican was not so lucky. The ogre came down with one foot right on top of the great black warhorse, squishing it quite flat. Wah! Wah! thundered the giant, then ran off down the path toward his house. Pogo ran after him. What are you doing? Quidpro shouted. My horse is stuck to his shoe. A moment later, Caligarant tripped over something and crashed to the ground, then began thrashing and bellowing even louder in pain and frustration, unable to get up. By the time Pogo reached him, the giant was wound head to foot in a net of fine silvery mesh. The trust Caligarant made an enormous hacking noise, then finally managed to spit out the plug of glue. It bounced away across the swamp like a hooked tee shot, ants hanging on for dear life, and yellow jackets fizzing angrily. How me, the ogre cried, his nose swollen into a crimson volleyball. Me caught in Vulcan's debt. Help. Why should I help you, dude? Pogo asked. You were going to eat me. The giant looked at him, considering. You help? Me let you go? Just eat your friend. Pogo examined the mess that had been Noble Rabican, knightly charger. Pretty much the only thing recognizable in the smear on the giant's heel was the saddle, chased in silver, shiny once but now slightly dulled by horse juices and a few fragments of the enchanted horn. Pogo wasn't going to be drinking out of it anymore. Quid probe hurried up, eyeing the tangled giant warily. Middens of Moorcock, how are we going to finish the quest, he wailed. Without a horse, we'll never get anywhere. He looked at the ogre and scowled. At least we could kill this ugly big bastard now. Just because me tried to eat you, Caligarant grumbled, seemed like overreaction. No, we're not going to kill him, Pogo told the dwarf. He'd been thinking about how Big Ed sometimes lifted Little Ed up on his shoulders to take things off the high shelves so he didn't have to go downstairs to the stockroom for the ladder. We're going to ride him. We want to file formal protest, the ogre complained as Pogo and Quid Probe tightened the girth strap around his neck. Quid Probe, not trusting the Pogo cash man's knots, also checked to make sure the giant's hands were securely tied behind his back. Treaty of Pax Nisiphori specified no saddles on prisoners. You tried to eat us, the pogo cashman pointed out, and you stepped on my horse, so basically, shut up. Quid probe had just got used to riding atop the huge battle charger, but now they were traveling at the height of the treetops. The forest itself was pretty in a primitive sort of way, its trees, streams, and meadows as well ordered as one of the departmental schematics Diggory was always making him study. But the rest of the experience wasn't ordered at all. In fact, it was downright disturbing, especially the part about having a skeleton. How did these creatures live with these weird struts inside them? Flexibility was almost nil. Who are those guys? The Pogo cash man asked, pointing to a small group of mounted, armored men in the distance. Oh, and there's some more over there. Wow, there's a ton of them. What are they doing? Quid probe shrugged. Performing, performing quests, most of them. The forest of our den is a busy place. If we bump into any knights, they'll probably want to fight. So tell them you're on a holy quest or you'll have to stop and joust every ten minutes. Do you know what that means? 
Oh, hell yeah. The creature nodded his head vigorously. I took this hippie chick to the Renaissance Fair in Agura once. I wanted to watch the jousting, but all she wanted to do was get her tarot cards read. Like three times? Two bucks a pot? I didn't even have enough left to get a turkey leg. The pogo cash man shook his head in sad recollection. I really wanted to try one of those turkey legs. Yes, very sad, said Quint Probe. But we must keep our minds on the matter at hand. With our horse dead, there's no point in meeting Bradamant because we have nothing to exchange for the hippogriff. So we might as well go straight to Prester John. The only problem is he's in Ethiopia. The ogre made a noise of irritation. <laughs> Me not swim into Africa. The pogo cash man wasn't listening. He had been distracted by a loud clanging from nearby. What's that? he asked. Quid probe listened for a moment, then felt the disturbing sensation of his hackles lifting. Brief pause for a second. Just to let you guys know, I usually I normally read about an hour. There's about a couple more pages left I'm going to read tonight, so another five or ten minutes, I would say. The pogo cash man wasn't listening. He had been distracted by a loud clanging from nearby. What's that? he asked. Quid probe listened for a moment, then felt the disturbing sensation of his hackles lifting. Oh dear, I completely forgot about Orillo. Maybe you ride him, suggested Caligaran. What's an O real O? the pogo cashman asked. Orillo. He's an infamous bandit, very dangerous, very cruel. And because of a magic spell, nothing can kill him. Even as Quid Probe spoke, the din from the clearing ahead of them grew louder, and now they could see the shapes of armored men through the trees. Three knights, one in shiny black, the other two in more colorful outfits, were fighting with swords, the two bright against the dark one. Poor fools, he said. They haven't a chance against Orillo. Why not? The pogo cash man asked. They look like they're doing pretty good. Watch. Even as the dwarf spoke, one of the knights managed to cut off the black knight's arm. The pogo cash man gasped as the black knight's sword clattered to the ground, but strangely, no blood came from the wound. Even so, the other attacker took advantage of the enemy's literal disarming and lopped off Orillo's head. But the bandit knight only bent over picked up his arm and put it back on his shoulder, where it connected and stuck. Then, as his two enemies watched in dismay, he found his head and returned that to his shoulders, where it also stuck. A moment later, he was attacking the knights again. Why are you laughing? Quid Probe asked the Pogo cash man. Because I saw this movie, Pogo told him. You know, I fart in your general direction. It's those nudge nudge guys. I have no idea what you're talking about, Quid Probe said, but I promise you that Orillo is real and very dangerous. He watched the Black Knight hammering his enemies who were definitely beginning to look as if they would rather be somewhere else. Unless his spell of invulnerability is broken, nothing can kill him. How do you break the spell? I don't know, said Quid Probe with a touch of aspersion. I don't know because some idiot burned our book of spells. You don't have to be all vague and sarcastic, Pogo said. I know you're talking about me. At that moment, one of the colorful knights snuck a lucky swipe past Orillo's guard and lopped off his head again. The force of the blow sent it rolling across the clearing. It fetched up near Caligarant's immense feet. Me smell something yummy the giant said. The pogo cash man climbed out of the saddle and jumped down to examine the bandit's head. Use caution. He's very dangerous, Quid Probe warned. Be cool, dude. I just want to check this out. There was no blood dripping from the severed neck, but the pogo cash man still held the head at arm's length by its feathered crest before opening the visor. The face inside was cheerful, if a bit sweaty, with handsome features, a gray shot beard, and black beetling eyebrows. Toss me back to my body, will you? said Orillo's head, 
Then if you want to have a go, just stick around. I'll soon have finished carving up these two. The pogo cash man, head dangling in one hand, climbed laboriously back onto the giant's neck. What if I don't? He asked the head when he was back in the saddle. I mean, what if I just hang on to your head up here? You won't be able to do much then, right? Yes, but my buddy will follow you around until it gets my head back. And then you'll have to fight me anyway. Orillo's head grinned. I cannot be killed, remember? So, basically, you are in deep mail. Either way. He saw the puzzled expression on the Pogo Cash Man's face. That is French for shit, the bandit explained. Oh. The knight's armored body turned and hastened toward them at a clanking trot. The other two knights, choosing discretion over pointless valor, took advantage of the distraction to flee the clearing. Within moments, the body had reached them and was jumping up and down in front of the giant, trying to reach its dangling head. Him smell good, said Culligarant, but the Pogo Cash Man was busy trying to work through what the Black Knight had told him. So, no matter what I do, I'm going to have to fight you? Pretty much, said Orillo. Say, you don't have a drop of claret, do you? I'm parched. Better wait until I'm back on my body, though, or it will just run out onto the ground, and that would be a sad waste of wine. Ho oh, ho! He was amused by his own joke. Ho oh, ho! Funny, eh? Too bad most people don't get to know that side of me. Arilo's head looked around as best it could while dangling in midair. Now, where did my body go? He tilted his eyes down as far as he could. Seriously, where is it? How should I know? The Pogo Cash Man was clearly feeling grumpy. Quid Crow pulled on his sleeve and pointed down. Um, you might want to... What? What's the problem now, little dude? Quid Pro pointed. Look, a pair of legs clad in black armor were poking out of the giant's mouth, kicking as haphazardly as a child failing a swimming test. Oops, said the pogo cash man. Quid Pro thought it was a bit of an understatement. The head was beginning to get frustrated. Oops, oops, what? Where's my buddy? Spit that out, the Pogo cash man told the giant. Go on, spit it out. Caligarant quickly swallowed down the rest of the body. When the ogre spoke, it was in tones of perfect innocence. Spit out what? Where's my buddy? shouted the head. I'm telling you, there would be trouble here. The royal assize is going to be passing through here in a fortnight or so, and if someone's nipped off with my body, there'll be hell to pay sure enough. Don't know um, what this royal assize is, the pogo cash man whispered to Quid Pro, but maybe we better not stick around. You may have something there, Quid Pro said. In fact, I'm sure you do. Despite the stream of invective coming from it, the Pogo cash man didn't seem to remember he was still holding Orillo's head until they were a good distance from the clearing. The giant, belly full, was whistling happily as he walked. I can't believe this! The bandit's head hadn't stopped shouting for a moment. I can't believe you just let your pet giant eat my buddy like that! That's not right! Is he really going to live forever like this? The pogo cash man asked Quid Probe as the Black Knight's head described all of his important friends at the court of Charlemagne, as well as several more among the nobility of Fairy, and listed the various penalties that could be levied against the owners of a dangerous steed like a giant. Uh, with no body? I think so. Well, and find me something to put this damn head in. When they found a suitable sack, still smelling of the onions that Quid Pro had hastily transferred to the saddlebag, Pogo dropped the head in. You're not really going to do this to me, are you? Orillo's head demanded. Damn right, till you learn to shut up. The Pogo cash man twisted the top of the sack and tied it closed. Merde, 
said the head's muffled voice. Yep. The pogo cash man looked down with no little satisfaction at the giant's distended stomach. Sooner or later, dude. And that's where I'm going to stop for today. On, whoops, on toilet humor, because that's just the kind of high quality writer I am. Anyway, um, somebody has sent me a very, very nice message here, which uh, Derek, which I will have to read at some point. Um, but at the moment, I am called to dinner. Um, there has apparently food been delivered downstairs, and I have run you guys a little past my normal deadline to allow you to get back to the evenings that you have before you. So what I will say at this point is thank you. Come back next week, next Sunday, um, where I will read the second half of the story. And uh, we have stopped about exactly halfway through. We will feel, hear the rest of Pogo's adventures in the matter of France um, and many other things, too. Um, and uh, I will also, who knows? Well, no, I won't, probably it'll take the whole time, but then, you know, we'll, we'll see if, it's, uh, if there's any time left over to do other things. Meanwhile, I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, I had great fun. I, I literally have not read that story since I finished it back in whenever the heck it must have been. Actually, I can, I can say, I think, in a moment. Uh, 2011, so been a long time. I literally have not read the story, so sorry for occasional moments of forgetting accents if that's what happened. Anyway, because um, of course, you know, when you write them, you don't make accents. You just have to pick them on the fly when you're finally reading them out loud. And I don't remember ever reading that story out loud. That is hence the sort of Monty Python French guy. Um, I thought it went with the scene of the Black Knight. Anyway, so thank you so much for joining me. Take good care of yourselves and your loved ones. Be kind to other people. Um, I will do my best to do the same. Be back with me next week. Have a lovely week. And yeah, that's it. Tons of love from our house to yours. And uh, even if you're not in a house, even if you're in a condo or a curly, curly sh snail shell, or you're an old woman who lives in a shoe and you have so many children, you're just fucking exhausted. I thank you and love and bye-bye. Have fun, everybody.